Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is our COVID-19 briefing for British Columbia for uh, Tuesday, September the 8th. Uh, we're honored to be here on the territories of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Uh, with the fall, which uh, isn't here uh, in a sense, but feels like it's here, I guess, after Labor Day, uh, come some scheduling uh, changes for our ASL interpreters. Nigel Howard and Sarah McFadden are returning to the campus to teach students in the language of ASL. And as a result, we'll be seeing less of them at our briefings. On behalf of the Premier, the government, Dr. Henry, everyone in BC, I want to thank both of them for their work. They have helped make our briefings more accessible and inclusive, and I know they will continue to make a huge impact in their teaching roles this, this fall, as will new interpreters who will be joining us in the coming days. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, uh, you'll be receiving a note uh, shortly. There will be a, a presentation by the Premier and myself and Dr. Henry with respect to updates to the pandemic plan uh, for the fall. That's tomorrow at 1 o'clock, and there will be a technical briefing associated with that. Uh, there will also be a written briefing at 3 o'clock tomorrow with uh, our daily written briefing uh, with case counts and other relevant information to the COVID-19 pandemic in BC. And Dr. Henry and myself will be back here on Thursday at 3 o'clock for a regular briefing. And with that, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you very much. We have a, a numbers of days to uh, report on today. Uh, so the following four reporting periods, uh, from Friday to Saturday, we had 123 new cases of COVID-19. From Saturday to Sunday, 116 additional cases. From Sunday to Monday, 107 people tested positive for COVID-19. And from Monday to today, 83 additional cases. That brings our uh, total of new cases since Friday to 429, including 12 epidemiologically linked cases, and bringing our total in British Columbia to 6,591 people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. That includes 2,249 in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 3,428 people in the Fraser Health Region, 184 people on the Vancouver Island Health Region, 460 people in the Interior Health Region, 186 people in the Northern Health Region, and 84 people who normally reside outside of Canada. We now have 1,386 active cases in all health authorities in the province. Of those, 32 people are in hospital currently, 12 of whom are in critical care or ICU. Over the weekend, we've had an additional two people who have died from COVID-19, both of them residents of long-term care, one in Fraser Health and one in Vancouver Coastal. And our condolences go to their families and to their communities and to their care providers. We know that we all feel their loss. There are now 3,063 people under active public health monitoring um, because of exposures to people with COVID-19 and 4,978 people who have recovered. We have three new healthcare associated outbreaks over the weekend. Uh, one of them at the Burnaby General Hospital 3C um, in Fraser Health and also at the Re Rideau Retirement Center in Fraser Health. And an additional second outbreak, luckily a small one at this point, at the Holy Family Hospital in Vancouver Coastal. As uh, you are aware, the uh, large outbreak at that facility had been declared over um, just over a week and a half ago. There is now a single case and we are hopeful that uh, with all of the precautions that are in place that that will remain a single case. That leaves us with 14 active outbreaks in our health care system, 11 in long-term care and assisted living and three in acute care. And our total of people affected in our in this uh, in health care is 753, 458 residents and 295 staff. 
We have no new community outbreaks to declare. However, I think people are well aware that there have been a number of exposure events over the weekend in many places around British Columbia, but particularly in the Lower Mainland. And we encourage people to continue to check websites regularly for alerts and to follow the guidance of public health. So as we get back here in you know, after the, lo uh, the Labor Day long weekend, as we get back to uh, to work for many people and back to school for many people, it is the time for all of us to cut back on our social interactions. This is what we all need to do now to reduce our risk of contracting COVID-19 for ourselves and for everyone around us. Keeping our household contacts and our controlled work and school groups safe means having fewer contacts with other people that particularly people we don't know. Whether it's a private party in somebody's home, going to a nightclub, going to a bar, the potential to transmit the virus is the same. When we're in those closed spaces, when we're having close face-to-face -face contact with people, and when we're in crowds. Being indoors is riskier than being outdoors. We know that now. Being in close face-to-face -face contact with people that we don't know that are mixing with other people, we know that's a risk. Being around people outside of our close household bubbles for an extended period of time is now a risk too. And in many cases, what we are seeing is large numbers of people being exposed inadvertently in those environments, particularly in some of the nightclubs and the bars and the parties that we've seen, in many cases, fueled by our use of alcohol. In recent weeks, public health teams have been heavily focused on responding to these community clusters, to identifying people, to making sure that the mostly young people that we're seeing in these exposure events are, are detected, are found, are isolated so that we can stop those chains of transmission. But this has been a very challenging thing to do. There have been a major source of transmission in many of these locations since our phase three reopening. And despite weeks of effort by public health teams, these venues are still the source of significant risk to everybody in British Columbia. And as you know, we adjusted the orders to try and make it a safer environment for people, but it in turn makes it more challenging to protect those who are more vulnerable to serious illness. And we are starting to see some spillover into other parts of our community. And we know particularly our seniors and elders are most at risk. A lot of time in public health resources have been spent on contact tracing connected to these venues because people and whether it's a private party, whether it's at a banquet hall, whether it's in a nightclub, are typically not connected to each other. And it is extremely time consuming to find people. As a result, we need to ensure that our public health teams are able to take care of everyone in British Columbia, to continue to find that balance of those cases and making sure that we can track people, we can find their contacts quickly, and we can support people effectively to stop the change of transmission. As a result, I am amending my order on bars, nightclubs, and banquet halls. Effective today, all nightclubs and all standalone banquet halls are ordered closed until further notice. In addition, liquor sales in all bars, pubs, and restaurants must cease at 10 p.m. and these venues must close at 11 p.m unless they're providing full meal service, in which case the meal service can continue but not serve alcohol. In addition, we are putting in provisions to make it easier for people to avoid having to speak loudly or shout or have close contact. And that means music or other background sounds, such as from televisions in bars, lounges, pubs and restaurants, must be no louder than the volume of normal conversation. As we know, uh, issuing orders is not something that we do lightly. It is our last resort, and we have spent quite a lot of time working with industry, within the banquet halls, in the nightclubs, to try and put in measures that will protect people from this virus and will protect our communities from people spreading it and inadvertently bringing it home or bringing it to their workplace, bringing it to other parts of our community. 
and we have managed to do that through the summer. But as our cases are climbing, as we are starting to move into the important parts of our community that we need to support moving into respiratory season in the fall, we need to make some changes to reduce the risks of these environments. We know the risk is greatest in nightclubs and bars. And we know that most restaurants in particular have been doing a very good job at keeping things under control. We know we had some challenges where people wanted to come in with large groups. We know that those have been dealt with for the most part and people are doing the right thing. So these restrictions are meant to um, take away that, that late night um, temptation that people have where we know that there's been mixing going on and where transmission is happening in these venues across the province. We recognize that these venues have tried and we've made adjustments and there are still exposures happening and both staff and customers are being put at risk. So that is the reason we are putting in these additional restrictions today. We need to find our balance to get us through the next few months to a year that we're going to be living with COVID-19. And that means we have to have both our economy, our education system, and our health system working. And we need to get back to that balance that we found when we were able to, to stop this virus earlier on this year. Now is the time for all of us to go back to our smaller, safer, social interactions, especially if we are increasing our social interactions in other ways, like going back to work and going back to school. The importance of having our work and school and preserving health can't be underestimated. We need to, each of us, imagine our social interactions are on a scale. And to stay safe, we need to be in balance. So if we are increasing our interactions in one way, we need to decrease them in another. If you have children who are going to school, who will be joining their learning groups and their classes where they'll be having contact, you need to consider spending less time with others in ways that you may have this summer with social interactions, with parties, with friends, and with after-curricular activities, depending on your own situation. In particular, host parties and social visits, now we need to keep low. We need to go back to where we were when we had our bubbles of five or six, and we still maintained our distance, particularly if we had people over who weren't within our household. So keeping your safest distance, which is around two meters, ensuring hand hygiene, ensuring that we are staying away from others if we're sick are the things that we need to go back to to get us through this next few months. Let's also recommit to keeping our walls strong here, to keeping our firewall up, protecting ourselves and those around us, and focusing on community wellness and our protection of those who are most vulnerable. This will help us to break those chains of transmission and bring our curve back down where we want it to be. Let's also remember that we can do this. We can get through this together. It is not forever, but it is a balance we need to find for now. And we need to remember to be kind and to be calm and to be safe. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Henry. I wanted to start by expressing my condolences, those of the Premier of the government, I think the people of BC, uh, to the family and the friends and the loved ones and the caregivers of the two people who passed away in the last four days from COVID-19 in BC, one in long-term care in Fraser Health and one in long-term care in Vancouver Coastal Health. We know uh, because of the circumstances of COVID-19 how difficult it is sometimes to come together to grieve and to be with one another in these difficult moments. And we want to ensure that those families and all of those people, all the people around those who passed away, uh, know uh, that we're with them in these difficult moments and that uh, this goes as well for the 211 other families. We have 213 people who passed away from COVID-19 and friends and communities of those who passed away from COVID-19 in British Columbia during this pandemic. As Dr. Henry has noted, 429 cases 
uh, is a significant number of cases uh, this weekend. Uh, in terms of critical care, in terms of uh, hospitalization, our numbers are uh, were relatively stable and, uh, over the weekend, staying at 12 in critical care, going from 31 to 32 overall in terms of hospitalization. But uh, and that said. The efforts being made now by people in public health are extraordinary. Consider the 3,063 people under public health surveillance who are essentially self-isolating because of their close contact with people who have tested positive from COVID-19. The active cases, the 18,593 tests that uh, were done this weekend with 417 test positive cases, obviously 12 EpiLink cases as well to add up to 429. So I want to exp again express um, both my support and my admiration for everybody involved in this public health effort, the contact tracing and the testing and the working and helping people who are sick uh, exemplifies the spirit of public health and, the, and everyone involved in public health is doing and has done this past weekend and throughout the pandemic an extraordinary job. Dr. Henry has laid out new measures uh, uh, with respect to nightclubs and the, to banquet halls. Uh, for new hours for the serving of alcohol, uh, new measures around background noise. These measures reflect the, an assessment of the evidence as they have from the beginning. In July, changes were made, you'll recall, uh, with respect to temporary rental accommodations to ensure the safety of everyone involved and all communities involved uh, in, this, uh, in this issue in every part of British Columbia. And these measures are in the same uh, are part of the same effort. They reflect the evidence of we see, where we see and where public health sees transmission, transmission occurring. And I think these measures reflect the continued need to stop and suppress the transmission of COVID-19 in BC. I wanted to uh, note uh, that uh, as, as we do at the beginning of each week, today on Tuesday, we we'll provide an update to, to PPE in the, uh, that has arrived in the province, both cumulatively since March and then specifically what has arrived over the past week. To recap our cumulative numbers from March to last week's report on Monday, August 31st, the following PPE had ar arrived at that point in BC, 6,300,095 or equivalent respirators. 50,500,000 50, surgical or procedure masks, 2,600,000 pieces of eye protection, 90 million pairs of gloves, and almost 8 million gowns. Uh, many of the items I've just listed and other equipment are, are in testing processes, and that has been our consistent approach to ensure that the safety requirements uh, meet or exceed uh, BC healthcare standards before use in the BC healthcare system. Today, I can tell you that over the last week, since the update on Monday, August 31st, up until yesterday, we've received the following. 51,710 N95 or equivalent respirators, 2,161,000 surgical or procedure masks, 30,949 pieces of eye protection, 24,987,970 pairs of gloves, and 760,000, 63,000 130 gowns. We'll continue to source and test our PPE and are working hard to pursue any and all credible leads for safe and effective product for our healthcare system. In uh, starting our fall effort, and it feels like fall today, even though fall is uh, f uh, a few weeks away, I want to note that last week uh, BC media, media marked the achievement by World War II veteran Peter Lake on his 100th birthday. He and his wife, Margaret, celebrated the occasion at home here near Victoria in Oak Bay in a neighbor's yard where they enjoyed a glass of beer. I think during COVID-19 that those who were not alive during difficult periods in our past, including World War II, are especially drawn to the presence around us today of those who lived through those times, who adapted to and overcame dramatic change in their normal lives. No one is comparing the current circumstances of, that, of, co uh, of World War II except to say that we are, many things are being demanded of us now. You'll know that in the United Kingdom, Captain Sir Thomas Moore, a World War II veteran, raised the spirits around the world in August by committing to walk 100 laps around his garden by his 100th birthday and raised 32 million pounds for the National Health Charities when he met that goal. John Hillman, 
who at 101 walked 101 laps uh, here on Vancouver Island in his BC retirement er, uh, home courtyard, raised over 160,000 for that project. Peter Lake celebrating his 100th birthday with his wife in a lovely backyard on a beautiful summer day is another example. By their examples, then and now, and that of our parents, our relatives, our neighbors, and our friends who lived in that time and shared their experiences with us, we learn from them. We learn from them how to make it through a difficult time when what we enjoy or how we enjoy it are very much changed or are just no longer safe for us to do for now. The qualities, the traits, the virtue they needed to make it through a world war are the ones we must continue to use in this very different but challenging time in which we can turn to for inspiration to make it through this global pandemic. Dedication and discipline, patience and perseverance, sacrifice and selflessness, and yes, some kindness. With Labor Day now behind us, it's back to school and back to work. As we enter the fall season in our BC COVID-19 effort, as we count down the weeks to Thanksgiving and start thinking about how we'll make it safe and more meaningful than ever in these very changed times, it's time to dig in to keep ourselves healthy and to stop the spread. It's been a hard fight so far. We're tired, I know we are, and we wish it were done. That COVID-19 were a thing of the past. That Dr. Henry did not have to bring in new provincial health orders today. That COVID-19 became a fading sight in a rear view mirror instead of a, an item that is closer than it appears. Right now we must dig in though. Right now we must stop the spread. But let's take comfort in the experience of others who came before us. Let's find strength in their experience. They faced a long battle of a very different sort. They were at war and we are not, but we can learn from their experience. We must aspire to emulate the best of their effort, dedication and discipline, patience and perseverance, sacrifice and selflessness, selflessness, and yes, quite a bit of kindness as well. Let's make these the hallmarks of our effort to stop the spread in the next five weeks. Aujourd'hui, nous faisons le point sur le nombre de nouveaux cas pour quatre périodes de référence de 24 heures chacune, soit celle des 4 et 5 septembre, celle des 5 et 6 septembre, celle des, des 6 et 7 septembre, et celle du 7 jusqu'au 8 septembre en mi-journée. Il y a eu deux nouveaux décès liés au COVID-19 durant ces quatre périodes de référence. Nous offrons nos condoléances aux familles et aux amis des 213 personnes décidées du COVID-19 et à tous ceux qui ont perdu des êtres chers au cours de cette pandémie. À ce jour, 4 978 personnes dans le test de dépistage de COVID-19 étaient positives sont maintenant rétablies. Pour la période, euh, première période de référence, nous avons eu 123 nouveaux cas. Pour la deuxième période de référence, nous avons eu 116 nouveaux cas. Pour la troisième période de référence, nous avons eu 107 nouveaux cas. Et au cours des dernières 24 heures, 83 nouveaux cas se sont ajoutés. Cela représente 429 nouveaux cas depuis notre dernière mise à jour vendredi pour un total de 6 591 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Il, euh, il y a aussi, euh, excusez-moi, parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés de COVID-19, 32 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, dont 12 en soins intensifs. Les autres personnes dont le test de dépistage a été positif sont en isolement à leur domicile. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Minister. Friendly reminder to reporters on the phone, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow-up. Please take yourselves off mute. You will not be audible until I call your name. First question is from Vaughn Palmer, Vancouver Sun. Good afternoon, Dr. Henry. Uh, last week, during your two briefings, in the first one, you said we needed to listen to you and we needed to step back. And on Thursday, you said we were at the precipice in terms of our contacts with each other. Um, are the measures, are you confident that the measures you've taken today are sufficient, will be sufficient to pull us back from the brink? Yeah, you know, that is the question. And um, there was a lot of uh, discussions that I had with my colleagues, with wise people over this weekend about, you know, what was where was the focus needing to be? And yes, last week I called on all of us to start thinking about transitioning 
we, we had a bit of a grace period in the summer. We were able to manage the cases. We were able to, to do the work of public health and allow people to, to have that time to get out, to be with, uh, with others, to be with family, um, to travel a bit. We now need to put our, our focus and our attention on the important things, the priority things of getting children back into schools, of getting back into our workplace, and having that balance. It's not either or, but we need to have the economic and the health. So yes, you know, these are some measures that we know are high risk environments that I was hopeful would come down with the things that we had done before, but they haven't. And so now we need to take more action. And we have uh, young people coming back for university, even though many of the classes are virtual. But we're seeing them as well, um, wanting to get together, wanting it to be like it was before. So yes, I do think these are necessary actions right now. It's going to be a challenging time for those businesses. And I think we need to all start thinking, rethinking about what we need to do to get us through the next few months as a community together. And these are some of the things that we'll need to put aside for now. And we'll need to focus on, on the things that we can do to stop the transmission and to make sure that our teams in public health are able to work with us and our communities to do that. Vaughn, do you have a follow-up? Yes, please. Um, were there other measures that your colleagues suggested that you considered but rejected for now that you might have to consider if this doesn't work? And what sorts of things would those be, please? Yeah, so um, there's always a spectrum of things that we can consider. Um, I, I think we have always tried to look at what are the things that uh, I, as you uh, probably recognize, I use orders as a last resort. And for things that affect all of the, the province, so provincial health officer orders um, apply across the province. So we do it for things where we know that it will make a difference, where we've seen transmission events. So we did it for vacation rentals, not just in one area, because we knew that it was the same issue in, in areas around the province. Same with this. Um, so all of my orders and, uh, and in discussion with my colleagues, we talked about, you know, timing of things. Should we add this in or that in? You know, what's the difference? And one of the challenges we have is that uh, the way uh, liquor licenses are for premises, it's a very, it's a spectrum and sometimes um, places can uh, get around some of the issues by serving more food and and that's what we were trying to wrestle with and nuance um, but it became really apparent that there were some venues that were just uh, high risk environments for staff for patrons and that we weren't able and the people who were working in these places in the banquet halls in the nightclubs were not able to uh, um, effectively use the measures that we had put in place so that's um, really important. There were, you know, we, we have always, um, and our, my colleagues, um, we have talked about this, we've talked about this with the other ministries that we've worked on. We want to ensure that the measures we take are not going to have more negative unintended consequences. And we stopped everything in March, as you know, quite quickly because we needed to take stock, we needed to find people, we needed to protect our, our health care system so that everybody could get care. And we took some very draconian measures. And since the very beginning, we have a team of people who have been looking at those impacts, whether they're positive or negative. And there have been many negative impacts of some of the public health measures that we took. For example, just you know, the, the fact that we um, had to reduce the number of people in shelters and the impact that that has had on, on homelessness, on people who have died from overdoses. So this is a rather lengthy way of saying we want to do the least amount we can by order and make sure that we can support people to do the right things that they need to do for their own individual situation. And we've seen that work here in BC. So I'm confident that these measures will be helpful for us in that one area where we were seeing ongoing issues and that the rest of us will work together to make sure that we can get through this fall and the rest of this pandemic um, together. And just really briefly, uh, tomorrow uh, the Premier and uh, Dr. Henry and I will be laying out the, some of the plans for the fall that uh, hopefully learn some of those lessons from what we saw 
in March and April and May. And so uh, public, public health orders, uh, officer orders are one way that we stop the spread. The individual actions of five million people across the province, the most important way that we stop the spread. And there are things that we can do in the healthcare system and some of those in our plan for the fall will lay out tomorrow, which are also obviously part of efforts both to deal with the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic and to stop the spread and to ensure that people are safe. So uh, it's uh, the extraordinary effort that's been led by our, uh, my Deputy Minister, Deputy Minister of Health, uh, Stephen Brown and, and Dr. Bonnie Henry continues. And I think one of the extraordinary things about both of them and then the entire team that's been working on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic within healthcare and within government is an always having the willingness to learn lessons and to apply them to the next step and the next actions. We're going to be dealing with this pandemic for a long time. There are going to be adjustments like we're, we're made today um, uh, in the future. And we have to continue simply to learn from what we know, learn from what we see in other jurisdictions, and co consistently do our best. And I think that's the spirit in which uh, Dr. Henry and uh, and Stephen Brown have led the enterprise from a government perspective. Next question is from Binder Sajjan, CTV. Uh, hi, Dr. Henry. I'm wondering if one of the um, I, uh, the things being considered was perhaps a delaying school, because I'm sure a lot of parents heard the fact that you know this uh, transmission is troublesome and taking this step, and just wondering if that was one of the, the things that uh, you talked about with your colleagues there. Um, not really, no, um, because we have been committed um, from the day that uh, classes were suspended in March, during March break, to making sure that we had um, the, the structure in place to support schools reopening as they did in June, as they're doing um, later this week. And what we have been focusing on are what are the things we need to do in the community to make sure that our community levels are low enough that that is um, continues to be safe and you know we we are very lucky in bc and it's partly because of the work that everybody has done together that our community transmission rates remain low and we know that that is the most important thing for getting schools going again. And I, I talked about the unintended consequences. And we have measured, and I presented some of this data earlier uh, this month, but we've measured the impact that not having in-classroom learning has had on, on families in British Columbia. And it's immense. And if we do not put our priority as a community on getting um, children back into the school setting and getting their education, their learning, their social interactions back together. Um, we will have long-term generational um, downsides to that. So it is a priority and we need to do everything that we else we need to do in our community to focus on the importance and the priority of children being back in a learning environment in their schools. Do you have a follow-up, Binder? Yeah, um, I was just wondering. So, just you know, to clarify, when you say to pull back to your social, pull back your social bubbles, are we talking about going back to where we were essentially in March in terms of social interactions, um, but allowing for those uh, controlled um, interactions, as you say, at school and at work? I think that is a, a good guide to go with or you know we look at what we've done at uh, vacation rentals so having small numbers of people over and not having multiple people over at different times we've expanded quite a bit um, through our social connections through the summer as a, as, as a whole some people of course who have uh, more vulnerable people in their families or in their households have not done that but all of us, particularly, we need to find those balance, that trade-off in our own family to make sure that we can support children going back to school safely, going back into work safely, because we know um, many people have not had the option about uh, staying away from work. So yes, uh, I think looking at six, it was what we had talked about before, and that's what we're looking at at restaurants, you know, small groups of people, the same group of people, and uh, looking at how we can balance those risks for our own family. Next question is from Jane Side, North Shore News. Particularly, we need to find the balance, that trade off in our own to make sure that we can. Okay. Because we know. Many people have not had the option. 
Next question is from Marcella Bernardo, News 1130. Hi, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix. Thank you for taking my question. Um, Von Palmer did ask what other measures you may have been considering. Um, it sounds like if things don't improve in the next few weeks, are we looking at possibly implementing a curfew or something like that when it comes to people spending time outdoors and, and socializing? Um, actually, the curfew is not something we had considered. I, I think from the very beginning, we've looked at risks, and there's a spectrum of risk. And we know that outdoors is less risky than indoors. What we see um, coming up is the fact that as the weather changes, we'll be less and less able to spend time outdoors. And I'm thinking about restaurants with patios, um, some of the, the adap adaptations that we've had to allow for more people to, to experience you know, safely in restaurants. So what we're looking at is how do we adjust coming into the winter months, ha but making sure we can still continue to have our surgical renewal program. We can sti still continue to have visits to long-term care, that we can continue to have our essential services and people going to work, we can continue with schools. So no, we weren't looking at curfews. What we're looking at are, are how do we um, encourage everybody to make sure we have um, in place the things we need to protect our health care system, to protect our most vulnerable people, particularly as we know our seniors and elders in our communities, and how do we adjust that? And we can do that safely. We can do that um, through the measures that we're taking now, for, through really important things. That, and one of the, the key tools that we have in BC is the, the which is an order, is that every um, business or operation needs to have a COVID sa safety plan. So it's more looking at those plans and being able to modify them and put in place measures that can, can work in those scenarios rather than trying to shut things down or trying to um, do it sector by sector. So that's what the orders are reflecting today, that we are, are looking at you know, what can be done safely in the, in the venues that we've mentioned today. Marcella, do you have a follow-up? Um, I do in the sense that uh, a few days ago we heard Mike Farmworth, the public safety minister, talking about a family from the U.S. that got turned back and returned to the border. And I've been uh, wanting to check in with you about how concerned you are, Dr. Henry, about truckers who are considered essential workers transporting the virus into Canada because they don't have to self-isolate. I think we've had a few cases of, of the virus coming in from people that are actually essential service workers going back and forth. Yeah, and you know, border issues are ones that we have uh, had a lot of concern about, as you know. Um, and yes, we've uh, there now has been um, measures put in place. But I, I will say that from very early on, um, one of the public health orders that I had was around people returning from outside the country. That stays that you need to self isolate for 14 days. And though there are provisions for essential service workers like truckers who need to come back and forth, and airline. Um, uh, uh, airline workers and others, but the, the provisions are that they need to be screened daily, that they need to reduce their their um, uh, their community activities, that they do um, take measures to to um, make sure that if they have any symptoms at all, that they get. Uh, tested and that they reduce their contacts outside of their home. So it's not a you're, you're get out of free. You do need to come back and you do need to take measures to protect uh, those around you. And uh, yes, we have had a, a few people who've tested positive, but not very many. And most people are doing the right thing. And, and what we've been trying to do is put the onus on, on the um, businesses as well to have those uh, measures in place to, to monitor employees and to support employees to do that. They also are, are taking measures to ensure that when they're in the U.S., they reduce their contact with others there as much as possible. Next question is from Richard Zussman, Global News. Dr. Henry, do you have any concerns about uh, the COVID case linked to Mulgrave School in West Vancouver. And what's your understanding about whether field trips and other out of school activities uh, should be allowed this fall? Um, so I'm not aware of uh, the first issue that you brought up, so I have to get back to you on that one. Um, but uh, yes, out of school activities, I think 
there'll be a lot of outside activities, but it will be smaller numbers reduced. I don't see us having field trips. I don't see us having some of those um, more uh, uh, larger group events where we uh, go out and visit things. I think there's a lot we can do virtually now in terms of visiting museums and other uh, art galleries, etc., that can be implemented. And I've seen lots of really innovative ways that teachers are looking at doing this uh, this fall. And I, I, I have to say my hat is off to our teachers and educators in BC. They have come together in a way that is uh, remarkable and it's a very challenging time and I know especially this week there's a lot of anxiety but I think there's a lot of excitement as well and we are going to make it through this and this school year will be unique and different and it's going to be an adjustment for the first couple of weeks um, but we in public health will be there to support them too so yes I don't see inter-school competitions I don't see a lot of field trips happening but I do see the really neat things about going outside and having class outside and learning outside and those are some things that will be uh, new and exciting. Richard, do you have a follow-up? I do. On the uh, ban of nightclubs and banquet halls, can you explain to me uh, what qualifies as a nightclub? I know there's a liquor primary license. Is it those holders or who is going to be um, restricted by this new order? And for the order around the uh, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, uh, liquor restrictions, when does that come into place? Yeah, well, both of these technically come into place as of today. Um, there'll be a grace period where we'll work things out and the details will be worked out and posted uh, publicly within the next day or so. Um, nightclubs, it's sometimes, and this is this is where we've, uh, why I have lumped a lot of things together, but it's, uh, the, the, those who are nightclubs know who they are and our public health inspectors are aware of who they are as well. So some nightclubs have taken this to heart earlier on when they had outbreaks and they have pivoted their business model to be more like a, a restaurant and those are able to stay open. So I can't give you an exact description, but it's really um, those venues that uh, sole purpose is really entertainment and drinking and they have um, have limited food options so yes it's uh, it's complicated and I have been working with uh, uh, the uh, the liquor board and also our lawyers to make sure that we um, we get that sorted out in in the right technical way um, the the standalone banquet halls uh, there's a there's a sector and we've been in correspondence back and forth with um, their association over the last little while and it's been a challenging time for them and what I hear is that people go to these banquet halls and um, whether even though they may book a small party it becomes a late night venue with lots of people coming and it becomes a very much a challenge for the organizers to to have control over that and that puts their own staff at risk as well as at risk of being fined so Right now, those types of venues are too risky, and that is where we're seeing quite a lot of the transmission, particularly in the Lower Mainland, and then it's spreading to other parts of the province as people travel or, or go and have uh, other um, parties or, or get-togethers with friends. Next question is from Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, are you concerned young people will turn to private parties now that there are no nightclubs and the liquor cut off at 10 p.m., uh, especially uh, since young people have been driving, you know, the bulk of BC's caseload recently, and especially given your initial hesitations with restricting those areas because it would drive the problem underground? Yeah, and you know, it's trying to find that balance again, which just seems to be all we do in public health. Um, we do know that there have been um, a move towards private parties, some of them quite large that are now being broken up and we do have ways uh, of monitoring those and now we have a fee, a fine structure in place for those as well. So it, it is trying to appeal to people's better nature but then taking away some of the temptations that uh, have been repeated offenders in terms of venues where people continue to go. 
Um, and you know the challenge has been that some um, you know some larger bars and restaurants um, pivot at later night to become more like a nightclub or a lounger uh, area and those are the areas that I'm hearing from my colleagues around the province become problematic when people are having alcohol um, the lineups become less uh, un more unruly more people get together and it's very hard for staff to to keep the small groups apart and we have seen transmission and that's the concerning thing for me so we will you know I think there's also been a transition we're moving from um, the summer when we all needed a break we all needed to experience that socializing and that joy of being out with others and we were able to keep it under managed conditions um, and we were trying to work with industry to make it uh, safer but we are now at the point where we are seeing cases continue to increase those venues um, large private parties are issues and we need to start pulling back um, we know that we can do that when we looked at the cases that were happening in the Kelowna area after July 1st there was a concerted effort by business by the community to work together to find appropriate venues where people could party safely and of course you know, there's no more Canucks games, so <laughs> so we don't need these anymore. So no, I, I think we need to. Uh, uh, you know, this is a transition period. It's a transition period where we need to go back to our basics again. We need to we need to support going back to work and going back to school. That needs to be our focus and our priority. We have time for one more question this afternoon. For everyone listening, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix will release a joint statement this afternoon with the latest information on cases, hospitalizations, and outbreaks, which you can find at news.gov.bc.ca. For medical guidance on protecting families and communities, and for access to provincial guidance on COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. And for information about the province's pandemic supports, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. Last question is from Sandy Hall, CFAX 1070. Hi, how are you doing, everyone? Thank you for my question for letting me ask a question today. I'm so happy. Uh, I'm just wondering. Um, we are getting a lot of. I, I mean, I did a little traveling in the province over summer, and I saw a lot of people coming in from, of course, out of province, and we're seeing the caseload go up right across the country. Are we concerned now as well about people coming in from places like Alberta and Ontario, places like that? Yeah, and you know, our challenge, of course, has been we have so much cross-border, if you will, travel between Alberta in particular, um, Ontario, Quebec. We've seen quite a lot of um, people who might normally go to the Maritimes in the summer coming out from Quebec. Um, across Canada, we still have very low rates of transmission. So the risk is different in our country, although we are all seeing increases now, and that's not surprising. We knew this was going to happen as we started to restart um, and started to have more social connections. But across the country, we're all in the same place where we're focusing, we're pivoting now from the summer to school, back to school in Alberta, Quebec two weeks ago, Ontario this week. You know, these are things that we all have in common. So we're all looking at how we can do this. And I will say that, you know, we also are looking around the world. And of course, we've been, um, there's lots of information about what's happening in the United States that's very concerning. But if we look at countries that have also done very well in controlling their outbreaks and getting their pandemic um, situation under control, they're also seeing very similar to what we're seeing, although on a much higher scale. So places like France and Spain and Germany um, Italy again, uh, places in, in um, South Korea and others. And we're looking at the, the, what they've learned uh, about how to open schools safely, how to get the economies going safely, how to get that balance back again. So we, I think this is something that we're going to see with this virus. It spreads. It's in our communities globally. So we have to be able to, to manage it with our public health activities and focus on the things that are important in our communities. Do you have a follow-up, Sandy? I, I do. Uh, it's actually on a different topic, but uh, we're seeing a lot of people on uh, going back to taking buses. And while it's, uh, they say it's mandatory to wear a mask, there's a lot of people taking their masks off once they sit down. And there's still a lot of people getting on the bus without a mask. Is that something to be concerned about? 
Yeah, I think it's uh, like mask wearing in, in venues around the province. There's a place and a purpose and a time for them and we do encourage them, particularly on places like transit. But the, the transit uh, authorities across the province have universally said that they will um, take an educational approach to this and I believe that is the right thing to do right now, making sure that people have access to masks, that they have them with them and that they know how to use them properly. So yes, you need to keep it on when you're on the bus. But I will also say that we sometimes don't uh, know why somebody has a challenge wearing a mask or keeping it on for a period of time. So we do need to um, give them the benefit of the doubt as well. And there are a small number of people who aren't able to wear a mask for a variety of reasons, whether it's a physical disability, whether it's challenges with um, having something in front of their face. And, and we need to be respectful of that as well. But I've also heard, uh, you know, from the stats that they've put out that uh, over 90% of people are wearing masks and I think that's great. And that culture of wearing a mask in those situations is something we need to all embrace. We're going to go back to Tanya Fletcher. Sorry, okay. I cut her off. And she would like a response in French, Minister. Go ahead, Tanya. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm just wondering as a follow-up, uh, how big of a concern uh, are bars and restaurants still? And at what point would you revert back to banning in-service dining and, and perhaps go back to takeout only? And, and yes, an answer in uh, French from Minister Dix would be appreciated. Thanks. And I think that's a really good question because pubs and restaurants have been doing a great job. It, it was a challenge and they started off slowly, um, but you know the plans that we've seen in restaurants and uh, I feel restaurants for the most part are really safe. I, I go out, thankfully, um, especially I, I don't know if I'd survive without them. Um, but you know the restaurants are doing a super job. Sometimes they've been pushed and we've had that happen in, uh, during the summer where we've heard of people wanting to go in in big groups and and there are restrictions in restaurants that are quite um, that are designed to make them safe and where the people who are following those are doing well and it keeps the staff safe and it keeps everybody who's in the venue safe and there's lots of great things that people are doing whether it's putting in barriers um, expanding into the outdoor patios making sure that um, the servers are are keeping a distance that there's hand hygiene, that we're taking people's names and that where people are staying home if they're not feeling well. So I am, I'm very confident that what we're doing in the pubs and, and restaurants is working and it's working well and I hope we can continue that as we go forward. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think that restaurants and, uh, and pubs have generally do, done an extremely good job. I think the purpose of the orders today was to address um, specific problems that had developed and to take uh, the appropriate solution. And sometimes that has to happen. And so the decisions around banquet halls and nightclubs, the decisions around uh, serving uh, alcohol only until 10 p.m., the decision around the noise level in, in, uh, in such uh, places are important decisions intended to stop the transmission of COVID-19. And we need to continue in all workplaces for, work, for workplaces to follow uh, public th their COVID-19 plans. And I think in general, the restaurant sector has done an excellent job at that. En français, je dirais que les restaurants ont fait un grand travail depuis uh, l'ouverture uh, des restaurants au, au mi-mai. Et je pense uh, le travail qu'ils ont fait um, et démontré par les faits, par la vérité, c'est qu'il n'y a pas beaucoup de transmission dans les restaurants. Nous avons euh, des questions sur les, euh, les boîtes à nuit, euh, sur les, euh, les, les euh, salles de banquet, un peu, euh, surtout dans la région de Vancouver. Donc, on a le, 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 doc, le docteur Henry a tranché aujourd'hui en disant non à cela et c'était une décision fondé sur l'évidence, mais forcé de reconnaître qu'en général, euh, les restaurants ont fait un grand travail, un travail important, qu'il y a beaucoup de, de monde qui y travaille, et que c'est important d'avoir des, des, des espaces organisés où les gens euh, peuvent aller et, euh, et avoir une bonne soirée, alors qu'en même temps, on prend l'action euh, dans les, les circonstances où c'est nécessaire et c'est ce qu'on a fait aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much.
until uh, tomorrow. Thank you.